So it's uh, it's quite an honor to be uh, at this prestigious uh, conference for uh, Franck Merle. Uh, so while we're not really in the same community, I think we know each other since uh, a very long time, since we're about the same generation. And the last time uh, we met uh, was with uh, Yvon, I think a memorable uh, entrecote uh, dinner, lunch somewhere in the southwest of uh, Paris. Uh, so uh, congratulations. Um, so what, I, what I'm presenting is probably not really uh, kind of at the, uh, at the core of the expertise of uh, the people here around. It's about uh, partial differential equations with uh, uh, probability, with uh, so stochastic partial differential equations in the uh, singular case when these equations re need to be renormalized. And uh, so I guess some people here, because of Bourguin, uh, uh, are uh, somewhat familiar with certain aspects of, the, uh, um, uh, of this theory. Because of my limited background, I will stay completely on the elliptic and parabolic side and never touch the, uh, uh, the dispersive side. What I'm reporting on is joint work with uh, uh, these three uh, uh, PhD students, postdocs at some point in, uh, in Leipzig, based on earlier work uh, 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 with uh, uh, Hendrik Weber, Jonas Sauer, and Scott Smith. And uh, let me get right into, uh, uh, into the subject. So um, I would like to, uh, for, for the purpose of this talk, I would like to focus on one uh, a very well-studied example, uh, which is uh, what in quantum field theory is called the 5-4 uh, model. Uh, in, uh, uh, in PDE uh, language, you might say it's, uh, it's an Allen Kahn equation because on the left hand side, your uh, linear uh, differential operator is just the heat operator, which uh, for reasons which are just have to do with convenient notation, I would write like this. So the zero direction is the time like, and one to D are the space like variables. And on the right-hand side, you have a cubic nonlinearity. It's convenient to put uh, uh, kind of a parameter, which of course may have either sign. So uh, uh, in, case of, uh, in case of the usual, the good sign is the positive sign, uh, a cubic nonlinearity. But then the, uh, the fact is that this is driven by noise. So there is a right-hand side, which is noisy, which is random, which is very rough. So uh, one uh, easy example, the standard example, although I will deviate a little bit from this in this, in this talk, is to think of this as being white noise. And uh, uh, so some of you might be familiar with this type of uh, counting. Uh, uh, the regularity of white noise depends if you try to map white noise onto the Helder scale. Uh, it depends on, uh, on the dimension. The higher the dimension, the more irregular it is. And there is something like an effective dimension. If you're in the parabolic setting, you have to uh, count the time dimensions twice. So, uh, and then it's always fractional, it's over two. So if you're uh, in effective dimension four, uh, white noise would, be, uh, would have regularity of minus two. Uh, uh, so that means, uh, because it's actually slightly below minus two, the solution of the linear problem would already be no longer a function. And even if you take the solution of the linear, fu the linear problem and you cube it, it's, uh, it's an operation which doesn't really make sense because you take the cube of, uh, of a distribution. So, uh, so this problem has serious, uh, and it's well known, and uh, serious problems. And in fact, uh, it's not just a technical issue. Um, you cannot really make sense of the equations as they stand and they need to be kind of changed or renormalized. And that's what's done by, uh, by so-called counter terms. Uh, so you kind of change your problem, you change your PDE with the goal of keeping your solution manifold controlled. And you do that by kind of adding potentially, uh, you know, I mean, new terms to your equation uh, hopefully as little as possible, you know, you don't want to change your equation too much in such a way that the solution manifold stays controlled. So you would, you know, a typical ansatz would be to put in there all kind of terms which are formally lower order. So since here you have a cubic nonlinearity, you would put a quadratic, a linear, and a constant term. And since this is a second order operator, you would put a first order uh, derivative here. 
And then you would have all these coefficients, which I here gave kind of uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, strange notations, because in the end, I will just keep this one, uh, h double prime h, h prime, h i, summation convention, which I'm using here. And, uh, and the idea is, of course, that you have to choose these coefficients once for all, depending on your ensemble, on the probability measure you endow your right-hand side with, so, so which describes your noise. And they also may depend on the parameter, but that's it. They should be the same for any solution, any type of boundary initial value problem you might want to ask. And then there is an kind of an easy uh, uh, reduction. If you make uh, kind of very benign assumptions on your noise, which would, for instance, be satisfied by white noise, like stationarity, meaning that the law of this random field uh, is invariant under translation, then you would uh, uh, get, or you know, it's natural to assume that all these coefficients are space-time constants next to being deterministic. If uh, uh, the law of your um, uh, 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 noise uh, is uh, kind of even in the sense that minus psi has the same distribution as psi, kind of these two terms would drop out. And in addition, if you would have some reflection symmetry in every of the coordinates, which of course you would have if you would assume isotropy in space in every of the spatial coordinates, then also this term drops out so that at the end, uh, and perhaps I'm going to use after all a little bit the blackboard uh, or the whiteboard, uh, you would end up with uh, um, this um, ansatz for uh, for renormalized equation, and uh, so the um, the goal of renormalization then is to uh, 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 um, to choose this counter term, this term h in a way that the solution manifold stays under control. But first of all, you have to try to make sense of this equation. So for instance, you could do that by, in some way, for instance, the easiest way would be convolution. Regularize your uh, noise term so that you're in the classical setting. And then, uh, of course, also this counter term should depend on epsilon. And you want to choose this counter term, term and it typically has to be divergent, in such a way that uh, you preserve as many symmetries of your original problem as possible, but at the same time, your solution manifold stays controlled. It doesn't go away. And uh, uh, in order to make, uh, to make sense of the kind of this, this quest of keeping your solution manifold controlled, it's natural to think in terms of a parameterization of the solution manifold. In a sense, introducing coordinates on the solution manifold. And that's uh, uh, that's what I want to uh, that's what I want to do next, and that's kind of a standard standard approach in uh, in, uh, uh, in 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 this uh, in this field. So um, so here again is uh, is the problem. So we have the heat operator phi, we have the cubic nonlinearity, we have the noise, we have the counter term, which is just a kind of a deterministic constant, which depends on the parameter in front of the noise strength, and of course. Uh, if lambda should happen to be zero, so if you're in the linear case, then also this h should be equal to zero. So, um, so now let's think of a, a parameterization of the manifold of solutions. And to get an idea, of course, the easiest case is to think of the linear case. So you switch your nonlinearity off by setting the parameter lambda equal to zero. Then you have a, a, then you have a linear equation. And the only right-hand side term is, is the noise. And of course, uh, that means that the solution manifold is an affine space. Uh, and the linear space, uh, which it is modeled on, or which is behind this affine space, is just the space of all uh, functions which are annihilated by the heat operator. And uh, those are analytic functions. Those are very nice functions. So this, in, in the linear case, the solution manifold is an affine space of a very nice linear space. And because this linear space is so nice, because you know, now we heavily use the fact, at least in this heuristics, that the operator is a nice is an elliptical parabolic operator, we know that this linear space consists of analytic functions. And analytic functions, in a certain sense, are naturally endowed with coordinates. Uh, if you kind of write down a power series, uh, or if you take the jet or the derivatives, 
in some somewhat arbitrary chosen point, which here I will take to be the origin, which of course a priori doesn't have any meaning. So, uh, so here we have already found coordinates uh, uh, for the solution manifold. If we find one distinguished point on this affine manifold, I'll mention that in a second, in the linear case. And then from standard nonlinear theory in the smooth case, it's conceivable that this uh, kind of uh, parametrization will survive as you kind of crank on the nonlinearity. Of course, it will become a nonlinear perturbation, a nonlinear parametrization. So that's the, uh, that's the way you like to think about it, and uh, that's the ansatz uh, you make. And then um, uh, it's, it's convenient to continue to use these coordinates. And what you, uh, uh, what you end up with is kind of at least a, a formal series representation of a general solution, phi, which you want to uh, think of as being a function of the parameter in front of the nonlinearity and uh, 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 um, a kind of uh, an analytic function or think of a kind of uh, um, uh, a polynomial uh, in, in the following way that you want to write your solution as uh, a series in terms of these coordinate monomials, which you get by taking these coordinate functions and building uh, the corresponding monomials. So this would be an expression which is a monomial in, in lambda and all space-time derivatives of any order of, of the p with some coefficients which are random space-time functions. So that's the, uh, that's the ansatz that you want to write a general solution in this way. Of course, this is extremely crazy. Uh, and this, in general, uh, this sum will not converge. But that's an idea which has been, for instance, used in a successful way in numerical analysis of ODEs, uh, uh, where, you, uh, uh, where you also would write down uh, a solution as such a formal power series. So uh, perhaps let me uh, just so that you <clears throat> can look at it a little bit, uh, write it here. So you want to write uh, uh, phi, at least formally, as a sum over all possible multi-indices, uh, beta, uh, 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 with coefficients, uh, which are space-time functions, and uh, uh, this monomial, uh, which depends on lambda and p. And the definition uh, is that uh, z to the power beta is 3, c3 to the power beta 3. Uh, so the reason for, for this strange notation that I use Z3 here is that it's a cubic nonlinearity. And uh, 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 that's just uh, kind of, uh, we got used to that notation. So just uh, accept it for a moment. D plus 1, Zn to the power Bn. And uh, Zn of P are just the... Uh, derivatives of p at the origin and z3 of lambda is just lambda. Okay, so um, so that's a priori, just, uh, just a <clears throat> an ansatz. And, but it, it is a very convenient ansatz and uh, it helps you to think about the problem in the right way because uh, formal power series uh, have kind of, kind of a very kind of uh, nice have nice algebraic, nice and simple algebraic properties. So that's what I would like to explain on uh, on this slide. So whenever you have some algebra like the real numbers or a function space, you can look at the uh, uh, at the space uh, of uh, formal power series in a number of uh, uh, variables, and here the variables will be infinitely many the z3 and these zn's. And uh, um, uh, so they typically, you know, they have no reason to converge. Anyway, these are formal variables and infinitely many formal variables. But you still can multiply them, very much like uh, polynomials. You have the same kind of multiplication rule as if you would multiply polynomials in these variables. And of course, you have a unit. And uh, so uh, if you recall this, uh, uh, this ansatz of writing the counter term as these formal power series, 
you see that kind of a more kind of compound or more compact way of thinking of the counter term is in terms of these coefficients c as denoting a form of power series in the z3 variable and these space-time functions pi as being a form of power series in these infinitely many variables uh, with coefficients which are in the algebra of space-time functions, let's say for the moment, smooth space-time functions and smooth and random space-time functions of finite moments. So that's a, that's a convenient way of looking upon this because then you realize that uh, there is a simple uh, translation of your, um, uh, of your original PDE uh, in terms of these uh, uh, power series, form of power series. So in, uh, in terms of these uh, coefficients, which now you accumulate into this uh, object, uh, well, I shouldn't use this one, which you accumulate in this object uh, pi. So pi is now something which is in this function space and uh, uh, lives in these variables. Then this PDE turns into a, a kind of something which still looks very simple and compact. So you apply the operator L to pi, which of course means you apply just to every coefficient individually. And this should be equal to Z3, which is the placeholder for the lambda, pi to the power 3, which obviously corresponds to the power 3 here, plus C, which is the placeholder for H, times pi, plus the noise times the unit in this, uh, in this algebra. And uh, this I will often call pi minus. So, uh, and now once you're, uh, uh, once, you're, uh, once you're on this level, in fact, uh, uh, things now make sense rigorously term by term. So you can write from this identity you can kind of deduce uh, a hierarchy of, uh, of equations, which at least as long as psi is smooth, as long as you have the regularization on, uh, uh, make uh, perfectly sense. And uh, under, certain under certain conditions have unique, uh, unique solutions. Uh, so in a certain sense, this, this hierarchy of equations get, gets anchored by, uh, by, by, uh, by looking at its zero, uh, uh, by its uh, kind of zero component, in which case only the xi survives, so the pi zero is nothing else than the solution to the linear problem. And in fact, by our assumptions on the noise, uh, there is a unique stationary and centered solution of this equation. Uh, if you uh, uh, look at multi-indices beta, uh, which are in a certain sense unit vectors, which just put a one into uh, uh, one of these coordinate functions and zero else, uh, then uh, from, uh, I mean, you feed in the, uh, the standard polynomials, then you see that not all multi, uh, multi indices are populated, but uh, there is a certain population condition. And here's an example of the kind of the first four, let's say, uh, multi indices. So, uh, and in fact, in terms of the right hand side, so uh, if you want to compute uh, the coefficient of the multi-index, which just puts a one in the uh, Z3 variables, you recover kind of the uh, cube of the linear solution plus the counter term. Uh, for this one, you get three times the linear solution to the square plus the bare counter term and so on. And you see that eventually, you know, pretty soon these expressions get more and more complicated. So it's convenient to work uh, and to think more on this abstract level than to try to write down all the, uh, this entire hierarchy. So it's kind of simplification in, in terms of thought. And uh, so uh, in the context of the solution theory, uh, we introduced this, um, uh, 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 this way of thinking in terms of multi-indices and this way of algebra in, a, in, in an earlier paper in a completely in a context of a different type of uh, stochastic partial differential equ equations, which are not semi-linear, but have more of a quasi-linear uh, non-linearity, which is, uh, you know, quite uh, active uh, in terms of singular quasi-linear PDEs. And, uh, and there, is there is, in fact, although uh, there is, in fact, an interesting algebraic uh, 
aspect to it, and uh, 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 we, uh, we, we wrote a completely algebraic uh, paper on, the, uh, on what's called the structure group, uh, which arises from, from this type of approach, uh, which then was also uh, taken up recently by uh, Ivan Bounet and uh, his PhD student. Okay, so, but now let's go back to, uh, uh, to this question of, uh, uh, can we show that the solution manifold, as we now defined it, at least term by term, stays, you know, does it stay controlled if we let the regularization go to zero? Do these coefficients stay under control? And, uh, and kind of what gives you the right idea is the fact that there is also scaling in this problem. There is a, a, a scaling transformation which acts on the nonlinear solution space. And in a certain sense, whatever you want to do, whatever you do, you want your renormalization to be compatible with that scale invariance, this action of scaling on your solution space. And of course, the starting point of the scaling is a parabolic rescaling of space-time uh, by some factor r, as indicated here. And then uh, you don't have to read the details. There is a certain way uh, on which uh, the scaling operation acts on the right-hand side, on the solution, on the parameter lambda, on the counter term, so that the form of your equation stays preserved. That's uh, uh, not, uh, not a big mystery. And now you want your, par your parametrization of the solution manifold to be compatible with this action. And if you do that, you see that also these coefficients should uh, satisfy a certain scaling law in terms of uh, a number which uh, is typically called homogeneity, which you can attach to multi-index beta. You don't have to absorb the formula kind of comes out uh, uh, by one of these typical scaling arguments pretty easily. And uh, uh, so that's, uh, that's a structure, an additional structure, which you, which you have, which uh, whatever you do should, uh, should be preserved. Why? Because um, you want to eventually use it once your regularization goes to zero. You want to use it for noise which has a scaling in law. So white noise has a very specific scale invariance in law under this type of affine rescaling. And, uh, uh, um, and let's think of something which is even more general than white noise. So a Gaussian noise, which has a Cameron Martin space, which is not given by L2, which would be white noise, but by a fractional Sobolev space characterized in the parabolic sense, characterized by the exponent alpha. Then uh, it is well known that this noise is invariant in law under this transformation. If you uh, choose the scaling parameter s to have this value. It's essentially minus the effective dimension over 2. We're back to the what I explained at the very beginning, the notion of an effective dimension, which in case of a parabolic problem is the space dimension plus tw twice times the time dimension, uh, plus alpha, which is kind of the, uh, the exponent which defines your cameron martin space or defines your homogeneous fractional parabolic uh, Sobolev space. So whatever you want to do is uh, uh, you should do it in such a way that your construction, your parameterization preserves the scaling. So you also want pi, uh, what's in the jargon of regularity structure is called a model. So your kind of uh, accumulated coefficients in your representation, you want them to inherit the scaling in law. And then uh, what you, uh, what you infer from this is instantly an estimate on how these coefficients should be estimated. So if you look at a certain stochastic moment to the power p of uh, the coefficient pi with the multi-index beta, uh, and you convolve it, you average it on a parabolic scale r, then this quantity should behave like r to this homogeneity. And note that this homogeneity, in fact, might be occasionally zero, uh, negative. It's not a positive number. So in that sense, the notation of using kind of absolute value bars might be a bit misleading. So therefore, uh, uh, we also need to express this in terms of convolution and it, not in terms of a Hölder type of increment. So that's, uh, uh, that's, what, you, uh, uh, that's what you want. And let's, let me, again, make a little bit of examples. Uh, let's look at the case of four space dimensions. Now, we all have heard of uh, um, 
Eisenman and Dumille Coupin's result that 544 is uh, trivial, but it's uh, uh, much easier and non trivial if your noise is not white noise, but it's slightly more regular. So it's Cameron Martin space is an H dot alpha with a strictly positive alpha. Uh, in this case, uh, you see that you need alpha to be positive in uh, the four space dimensional case, in which case the effective dimension is six, because otherwise, uh, and that's the kind of typical, what's called the dimension counting problem, under this rescaling operation, your nonlinearity which not, would not become smaller, but it would become larger as you go down to smaller scales. So that's an easy kind of a more hand-waving way to see that in this case of four space dimensions, alpha needs to be positive for this problem to have a chance to be uh, well-behaved. So, uh, uh, so here are uh, kind of, uh, uh, an ex kind of uh, uh, a couple of first uh, um, exponents, uh, multi-indices uh, and their homogeneities. And you see that tip, you know, some of them will have definitely negative homogeneity. Many of them might actually have negative homogeneity and some of them have uh, kind of positive homogeneity. And, uh, uh, and, but however, uh, the homogeneity is not to be confused with the regularity of these coefficients. The regularity is typically worse because these coefficients, these random fields, uh, for most multi-indices beta are not statistically stationary. So that's, uh, that's something different. For instance, you can see that uh, by looking at this multi-index, uh, which has a homogeneity which is even larger than one, but still uh, the right-hand side is as rough as the right-hand side uh, uh, for, um, uh, uh, for this thing here, which uh, has a homogeneity of two alpha. So the bare regularity of this one is not one plus two alpha, but just two alpha. So the homogeneities give you the scaling, but, uh, but still the objects could be rougher than the scaling uh, indicates. And here is, here is the main result. So <clears throat> we can exactly prove the estimate which is, uh, which is predicted by scaling, uh, provided uh, 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 we're looking at the corresponding Cameron Martin space. And in fact, uh, uh, the condition is more general, so we don't need to work in the Gaussian case. What we really need is what's called a spectral gap estimate. So we could also work with uh, more general ensembles and I explain what the spectral gap estimate is in a second. So, uh, so the statement is that uh, provided we have an ensemble, a noise ensemble, which I always will use the name E for, which satisfies these symmetries, which I explained in the, in the beginning. So that was the translation uh, symmetry in law, uh, the parity in law, uh, the reflection symmetries in law. So that's what I mean here and provided it satisfies a spectral gap estimate with the Cameron Martin space, which is given by a fractional Hölder, a fractional Sobolev space of a positive exponent, which has to be irrational. And uh, uh, that's a subtle condition, which comes in uh, from the fact that Chowder theory doesn't hold in the integer case. And if the alpha is rational, you might potentially have integer cases, and that's always bad for Schauder theory. In this case, you would expect to see logarithms in the scaling, which of course is an interesting thing, but which we haven't tackled yet. So if it's uh, positive and irrational, you get exactly the scaling, which uh, you can predict by the simple hand-waving argument, which I've shown you uh, two slides before. And here again is, is uh, uh, I explain the meaning of what it means. So you take, uh, you take this beta component uh, of your formal uh, series representation, you convolve it on scale R uh, with help of some once chosen Schwarz function, uh, which is parabolically rescaled in this way. And then you evaluate at the origin, which was the point we singled out. And that object has the uh, stochastic moments, which behave as predicted by the homogeneity. And that estimate is uniform in the regularization. And in fact, you can even give a sense to the problem in the limit. And there is a uniqueness uh, as worked out by Templemeyer recently. And uh, so um, what does it mean to satisfy a spectral gap? Uh, that's uh, if you want an infinite dimensional um, 
Poincaré inequality, a Poincaré inequality on probability space. Uh, so what it does for you is if you're given an observable or a functional of the noise, some general nonlinear functional of the noise, uh, then which you can also interpret as a random variable, uh, then the variance of this random variable is estimated by the expectation of the square of a gradient. And this gradient is the functional derivative of your of Reche derivative, which is a linear form of your random variable. Uh, you can at least make sense of this in the case of cylinder functions. That's how you kind of go towards Maliavin calculus. And the way you measure this, uh, 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 you measure the size of this linear form is by the norm that's dual to uh, the h dot alpha. And h dot alpha here, uh, I wrote it down again for you because, uh, of course, you have to kind of define it with the right parabolic scaling. So one convenient way of doing that is, uh, and we're also in, inside the proofs, we're using sometimes the semi-group generated by this, by looking at the square of your parabolic operator, which is positive definite, then taking the fourth root, which gives you something which is like one spatial derivative and then the alpha power and then the L2 norm. So that's the... Uh, that's 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 the condition. So uh, so that's uh, what we impose. And again, it's satisfied for Gaussian measures, which, as many of you will know, are just characterized by a single Hilbert structure. And the Hilbert structure is uh, kind of to be um, this uh, fractional super F space. So um, uh, so now in the remaining time, I, I'd like to uh, tell you a bit a little bit of. Uh, uh, what goes into the proof and connect it to, uh, uh, to existing and uh, kind of uh, later work. So, um, so the f kind of, as some of you will know, what I'm presenting here is in a certain sense uh, very much inspired by Hira's regularity structures. And uh, these types of stochastic estimates on what in the language of regularity structures is called a model, uh, kind of are the starting point for regularity structures. I mean, the, the kind of the spirit of regularity structures is to separate, on the one hand, a stochastic estimate of the model, and then a completely deterministic or pathwise uh, uh, solution theory uh, of your uh, SPDE. And, uh, and in fact, this, um, uh, on the level of regularity structures, what I'm, the type of result I'm presenting is kind of in, uh, in this major work by A.J. Chandra and uh, Martin Heira, which is not published, but which is existing since quite some time on the archive with uh, uh, this title. Uh, A.J. Chandra uh, gave a course in Leipzig on this uh, a couple of uh, months ago. So uh, it's a kind of a very math physics approach to, uh, uh, to these estimates. So. Uh, uh, you try to kind of estimate cumulants. You write down uh, uh, the index set, in this case, are trees. So you, you led to Feynman diagrams. It's an extremely combinatorial and deep work uh, and uh, quite different from, uh, 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 from what we did. But that's not the only approach to uh, these stochastic estimates. So there is <clears throat> also kind of an approach which goes via ideas of renormalization group, and in particular, a continuum version of the renormalization group, which goes by the name of Polshinsky uh, flow, uh, started by Kopjainen, but then a uh, kind of very recent uh, result by Pavel Duch, who was actually postdoc in Leipzig, uh, which uh, very recently has been taken up by uh, Gubinelli and a PhD student. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, Heira and Steele recently used our spectral gap approach and our inductive approach uh, to extend it to, uh, to the uh, tree-based framework, uh, which is typically used in regularity structures. So there is quite some activities and different ways of doing it. And now in the, uh, in the remaining time, I would like to explain to you why uh, this Malyavin calculus, so spectral gap and Malyavin calculus, so taking the derivative with respect to the noise, is something very natural in this problem. And, uh, uh, and in, in uh, uh, yeah, so of course I want to advocate this. Uh, and it's also very geometric and very analytic as opposed to combinatorial. So, um, 
So this is, this is one slide where I would like to explain why, why using the smart Yavin calculus is, uh, um, is, is a natural and good idea here. So, uh, but let me just introduce the notation. Uh, so if you, even, if you haven't heard about what my Yavin calculus is, uh, uh, there's a very easy way to think about it. It's just taking the derivative with respect to the noise. And if you're more of an applied mathematician, it's nothing fancy. You have the right-hand side, and now you perturb the right-hand side, psi, by some del psi, and then you take the derivative with respect to you know, this infinitesimal perturbation. So in a certain sense, you linearize your problem. So, uh, so it's nothing else than kind of linearizing your problem in the right-hand side. And uh, uh, what you gain is that uh, you may assume that this infinitesimal perturbation of your noise, the noise is very rough, but your infinitesimal perturbation now is much smoother. It's in this fractional Sobolev space. So it even has a small positive regularity on the level of L2, whereas the noise itself is rough. It's just a distribution of, uh, in our case, of order even worse than minus 3. Or, yeah, in this case, slightly better than minus 3. So you gain three derivatives by replacing an instance of the noise by an element of the cameron martin space. So... So this is why it's analytically smart, right? You suddenly redefined your problem and you replaced uh, something rough by something much more regular. But it's also conceptually smart because the problem is really the, the non-robust part is really this relationship here between the right-hand side of your equation and the left-hand side, this algebraic relationship, right? We have a division of the problem into a linear differential relation, which is benign, and a nonlinear algebraic relation between pi and pi minus. And here is sitting something that's divergent. So that's a bad way of writing it. So the hope is, if you derive it, if you take the derivative of it, it will get better. And uh, why is that kind of a priori not a bad hope? Because the counter term vanishes under the Malyavin derivative because the counter term is deterministic. So if you take the derivative with respect to the noise, it's zero. So it looks like a, a very natural idea. And, uh, and here, is, uh, uh, here is on uh, a kind of one, um, one slide uh, or in two lines, uh, this non-robust definition of the right-hand side as it relates to the left-hand side the algebraic relation between pi minus and pi. And uh, here is its Malyavin derivative, uh, where you just use Leibniz rule. And, um, uh, but now you see that you haven't solved all problems because you still have the noise here. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's not gone. Uh, so the, the C, this divergent term, is still present in this relationship uh, between pi minus and pi even on the level of the Maya van derivative. And moreover, uh, while it looks like that you have gained a lot of kind of regularity, in fact, you haven't gained any bare regularity because this delta pi minus uh, is still dominant. The regularity of the delta pi minus is still dominated by the worst part, by the pi square here. So it's in general not in this... Uh, um, in this in this Sobolev space, so it's a bit more subtle. While the uh, it's very clear that uh, uh, the basic idea makes sense, uh, uh, you have to work a bit, and um, and again, in a certain sense, symmetry comes to your help. And uh, in order to explain that on the slide after, uh, I have to uh, uh, tell you about what's called in 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 the framework of regularity structures the structure group which in our way of seeing it is in fact something very simple. So remember that at some point we took the origin somewhat arbitrarily. There was no reason. I mean, there is no origin in time space. And uh, so in principle, the pi which we defined or constructed based on the choice of one point, we could also do it with any other point. So in fact, we don't just have a single pi but we have an entire family of what's called centered models indexed by space-time points. Clearly, there should be a relation between these 
because they serve the same purpose. They serve the purpose of representing the same solution. So we can now represent the same solution in different ways. Uh, once based on the model on the pi with respect to the completely arbitrary Eurocentric origin and the other one with respect to some other center. And, uh, and now, uh, so that defines kind of a nonlinear map on these parametrizing polynomials. And now the idea is to algebraize like we did in a certain sense here, to lift this nonlinear map by pull back to a linear transformation on, uh, on the space of uh, uh, formal power series. And then uh, automatically it will be multiplicative, so it will be an al algebra endomorphism. And in fact, you, so you can, this change of coordinates, you can implement in a completely algebraic way with help of these change of base point transformations. And I'm using, like always, the notation of Hira, uh, uh, the gamma x. And here is an example of uh, one simple uh, uh, transformation in, in terms of its a matrix entry uh, with these two multi indices. And you see that it typically uh, arises from the model itself, evaluating the model, taking kind of derivatives of the model in, in one of the two base points. And in fact, we also estimate as part of uh, uh, our result, we estimate these, uh, these change of base point transformation. So, um, so there is this other, there's this other kind of nice structure to the problem that uh, you can, uh, uh, you have these change of base point uh, transformations. And that gives you the right idea of how to think about the Malyavin derivative, right? Because, um, so the, the, the basis was to say that, uh, you know, now we fix some base point x. The basis was to say that the pi x provide a parametrization of this nonlinear solution manifold. But if, the, if they provide a parametrization of the nonlinear solution manifold, they also provide a parametrization of its tangent space in a certain space. So, uh, in fact, taking uh, the derivative, the formal derivative, with respect to the coefficients of this polynomial entry, which means just taking the derivatives with respect to the Zn's, spans the tangent space. So there's nothing more natural than to try to express the Malyavin derivative, which is also something like a tangent vector, in terms of these tangent vector fields to your nonlinear solution manifold. And that's exactly the idea, uh, the idea we're using. We're going to uh, 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 write um, the, uh, the Malyavin derivative of the model in terms of uh, uh, an appropriate linear combination of these tangent vector fields. And we only need finitely many there because we can truncate. And uh, for being able to truncate, it's good that one can localize. And then these, uh, these objects here, which we call d gamma, have again a nice algebraic structure. They act a little bit like, uh, well, I mean, not quite like derivations because there is the gamma itself in it, but they act like derivatives of uh, uh, algebra and the morphisms. And, uh, um, and then, uh, then we can, with this uh, way of thinking, we can now implement, uh, uh, we can kind of find a better relationship between uh, the pi minus and the pi on the level of the Malyavin derivative uh, with help of this uh, new object, which ties uh, del pi to pi very much in the same way as it, as it ties del pi minus to pi minus. So that's now the way uh, how to find a more robust representation of this, uh, this nonlinearity. And uh, uh, on the level of the Malyavin derivative and kind of uh, this uh, infinite dimensional geometric idea of representing uh, uh, representing the Malyavin derivative as a tangent vector field to your uh, solution manifold. How much time do I still have? Okay, yeah, that's certainly okay. okay. okay so, <clears throat> so that's in a certain sense the, the structural idea of what we're doing. And uh, now, of course, in the end, it, it's estimates. And uh, uh, so, uh, um, 
so that, that's just one slide on, on kind of two more aspects of the, or three more aspects of the proof. So um, we run an induction. Um, it couldn't be an induction by homogeneity because this new object, object uh, doesn't have the right triangular properties with respect to homogeneity. In fact, we have to run a different type of induction. It's kind of interest, it's better to think in terms of three loops of finite loops of the induction, uh, which you run uh, in terms of how often you use the nonlinearity, in terms of uh, the homogeneity in the noise, which is this expression, and in terms of the mm, <clears throat> what's called the decoration uh, in terms of polynomials, which is, uh, which is this expression. And then uh, another good idea to uh, never lose, like in Kolmogorov's criteria, criterion, a little bit in your exponent, which you don't want to do because then you violate scaling, and scaling was such an important guiding principle. Uh, it's convenient to work with what we call annealed norms, which means you put the probabilistic norm inside and the spatial norm or the space-time norm outside. So that's, uh, that's exactly uh, uh, what we're doing. So here is one sample. So this is uh, uh, the way how we tie the Malyavan derivative um, of uh, pi minus to pi minus itself via, this, uh, via these tangent vector fields. Um, we want to look at kind of a convolution. We want to probe it by convolving it on scale r, uh, evaluating at this point x. We need to average over the point x. That's what we need in order to pass from this L2 base topology, which is important for Malyavin calculus, to the more Hölder based topology, which is important for anything else. Uh, and then we estimate this by uh, kind of an annealed version of uh, uh, the Cameron Martin uh, space norm, which is here. And uh, we get a positive exponent in this convolution scale, which is crucial. Uh, we get a negative exponent in this localization scale, but we don't care at this stage. And we get the right homogeneity in terms of beta. And, uh, and in the end, we're using very much, in the, inside the proof, we're using very much the tools which Haira uh, kind of propagates for the solution theory, which go by the name of reconstruction and integration. So, uh, so we really leverage these tools in a place for which... Uh, that hadn't been initially uh, initially used. Okay, so I think I'm I'm done. So uh, um, so I know that this subject is not really uh, um, really something that's uh, much done in this community. But I thought it would be perhaps interesting because I know that this community is very geometrically minded and thinks in kind of geometries of solution manifolds. And uh, and I think in that sense there is a uh, there is a connection between uh, what you're doing and uh, uh, what I'm presenting here. And, and so, uh, of course, what I like is that, uh, I don't know if some of you have been, you know, have encountered regularity structures in the principle, you know, the first thing you see is trees, right? I mean, they give you cherries, tripods, uh, uh, and then, you know, there's an entire zoo and it becomes very combinatorial. And, uh, but all the notions, uh, uh, live as well. I mean, all the set of regularity structures can be used in a much less combinatorial, much more geometrical and analytical way. Uh, uh, in, uh, in, in if you if you if you uh, if you go this way, and I think it's uh, it's um, it's as performant uh, uh, if you kind of replace uh, uh, replace the combinatorics combinatorics by these more geometric uh, by this more geometric uh, way of uh, thinking. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Comments? Can I ask a very nice question from a non mathematician? This equation is also the equation describing the motion of a domain wall, for example. Um, so can you can you deal with uh, periodic functions instead of the phi cube by the same technology, or is it a completely so cosine phi instead of? Um, I think there uh, in this case the uh, um, uh, 
um, uh, the um, uh, the scalings are different, and I think uh, uh, they're much closer to uh, to critical. Or there is a parameter in these equations which governs uh, uh, how uh, how close to criticality in the sense of non-renormalizability they are. So I would say uh, certain aspects, certainly you know, certain aspects of what I'm presenting here are. Um, are easily transferable to other problems, but then uh, uh, this one certainly um, uh, uh, produces uh, different and probably larger challenges, which have to, you know, this is not, uh, what I'm presenting here is not meant, uh, I think as much as regularities are not meant as, regularity structures are not meant as, uh, as something by which now you can solve everything, but, uh, but more, uh, Kind of a set of mind or tools or way of looking upon problems which help you to uh, to solve them, but which still would require their individual ideas depending on the problem. Um, other questions? So, in terms of range of applications, you say it's comparable to the more combinatorial approach. So, this could be larger. No, I wouldn't think it's larger. But so uh, so I mean, we started uh, we started getting into this because we wanted to um, uh, be able to deal with certain types of equations which are not semi-linear, which have kind of a stronger nonlinearity, and that's where we developed these things. And but then Heira and Garancy are short that showed that this can also be in a certain sense done within, uh, within kind of the more standard tree-based setup. I think, I mean, if, if at all, my hope would be that uh, um, certain uh, things become more transparent. I mean, sometimes in, uh, in, in the existing work, there are miraculous cancellations or certain symmetries which you discover at the end because coefficients in front of certain trees cancel. And I think this approach, uh, um, puts things together in a more natural way. It's in a sense, in the more parsimonious. And therefore, perhaps uh, it might, the hope would be it makes some of uh, these problems clear. But more general, I mean, larger. Right? Is, it, uh, is, it, is it that what you mean by the uh, symmetries are between top-down Yes, yes. So, so, so for instance, the scaling symmetry in a certain sense, we postulate it, and uh, uh, and and uh, um, in in this. So so I mean the in in the, in, in the more standard approach, uh, the more standard approach kind of goes as follows. So you have uh, you have the right hand side of your equation, or you have your problem, and it comes with certain operations like cubing, like taking the cube and solving the equation, or you know more complicated things. And then uh, a tree encodes um, a certain order of operating, of, of performing these operations. And in a certain sense, it's much more ambitious by um, trying to describe all these, uh, oper I mean, all these concatenated operations in a way, whereas, so that's what I, this is why I would call it bottom up. Whereas this approach says, let us start from the solution manifold. Let us not try to uh, uh, describe any possible uh, uh, Picard iteration or so, but we have a solution manifold, and let's uh, leverage on the symmetries, scaling symmetries, isotropy, translation events of the solution manifold in building these objects. That's more what I would say top down. Yes, uh, just a naive question, because I see that for no, 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 no. Cri criticality. We, we're we're not in the uh, we're not in the um, uh, we're always in the in the subcritical up to critical case, right? That's uh, so. So when I was saying d equal to four, I was cheating in the sense that I took a a noise which is slightly more regular than white noise. Yeah. D, D equal to four would be critical for white noise, and here, like in you know the standard regularity structures, we can only do things which uh, are close to critical but not critical. Yes. So it doesn't uh, it doesn't add anything anything to that. 
Um, not so 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 the heuristic is the, for the heuristic it's very helpful but uh, so for I mean in um, in the end so our, our primary application was uh, um, a quasi-linear equation of this form and uh, uh, while in order to get the right ideas it's good to think about a being analytic in the end, for the final theory, for the solution theory, you need, you need a high but limited amount of regularity on A. And how much regularity on A you need depends on how far you're from being critical. So it's, it's more uh, kind of, you think about these coordinates if you, if you think in analytic terms, but then in the end for the estimates, you don't really use that so much. Thank you again.